welcome back once again to the Imaginary Gallery. It's T J, your host, going further down the psychopath's bag of tricks, referencing without conscience the disturbing world of the psychopaths among us by Robert D. Hare, Ph.D. We're in the section Flies in the Web, which discusses getting caught into the web of a to be creature. Before going into that, though, I had a very strange visitor. The other night I was in here, and I heard a noise in the room over across the hall, and it didn't sound normal. But I knew there was no way an intruder could get up to that high of an area and make it in the room. I thought maybe it's the dog, but Hero was right here by my sides. So it was something else. Went into the room, looked, didn't see anything, looked all around, and then turned away and left. I thought, wait a second, I heard a strange sound. It has to be accounted for. So I went back in again, and I had this little bag of trash on the floor, a wall board that had crumbled and fallen, and I threw it into a plastic grocery sack, and it had chunks of the stuff in there. And I looked down at that and just looked away, but then I looked again at it, and it had something black on it, and it looked strange, like a strange shape that didn't belong there. And I looked a little closer, and I saw what looked like a little tiny, tiny hand of five fingers sticking out. I thought, that is a bat. It must have fallen through one of the slits in the ceiling and landed in the room. Ugh! But it wasn't moving, so I figured, well, maybe it's scared, because maybe the dog messed with it. So I took a large pot, put it over it, figured that'll keep it till the morning. Figured I'd take it outside the next day and set it free. I went to sleep and started having dreams about this creature in an office building like I had it with me, which was very strange. Then I woke up, went on to work, but then at lunch break, I thought, I've got to get rid of this. So I was strategic, and I took the inside of the section part of the dog crate, slid that under the bag, because it had the bat on top of it, and the bag in between, took it to the front of the house, took a long stick, knocked it, expected to see the creature, and guess what? There was no creature. There was no bat. And I figured, I must have imagined this whole thing. I thought maybe Bandit came back to visit, because I always used to call him a bat. I'd say, you look like a little bat. Figured maybe it was an apparition. But I thought, oh, I don't think so. Went back into the room, scanned the whole place, didn't see anything. Looked on the ceiling for a hanging bat. There was no bat. And then I came back again and looked again, and this time I looked right above the bed. And on top of the blinds, I saw a little black blob. And my heart sank, and I thought that. It. And I looked closer, saw the little pointed ears roosting up there. It wasn't moving. And I said, Bandit, is that you? And it didn't move, so I figured it's isn't Bandit. I looked up a bunch of videos on how to get rid of them. I read to open a window and take the screen out, which I did. And I had the fan going, which I guess that was wrong. But I shut the door. In the evening hours, when it's time for it to do its thing, I started to go in the room, and I saw it swirling around in circles. And I thought, oh my god, oh, I'm glad I wasn't in there. I would have been terrified. <laughs> I shut the door. Several minutes later, I went back in, and it appears it's gone. But we're moving on to deadly attraction. Dr. Hare says that he's always been puzzled by the strong attraction that many of us feel towards criminal people. He supposes that in many cases we vicariously live our fantasies out through the actions of these people that are willing to cross over to the wrong side of the law, which I've experienced that in grade school. These liberated souls often become folk heroes or role models for people too inhibited to act out their own fantasies of badness. Of course, most people are generally pretty selective about the folk heroes they choose. Pedophiles, petty thieves, and insane offenders are less likely to fill the bill than are rebels on the run like those portrayed in the movies like Bonnie and Clyde or Thelma and Louise. Perhaps the most bizarre example of deadly attraction is found during and after the trial of a notorious killer. There comes out to be a huge host of courtroom groupies, lots of pen pals, and avid supporters, love-struck fans as well. For these desperado junkies, the most powerful attraction of all is to the psychopathic serial killers whose savage crimes are sex-related. He mentions Ted Bunny, Kenneth Bianchi, John Gacy, Richard Ramirez. To give a few examples, they all had their enthusiastic cheering sections. In these cases, notoriety becomes confused with fame, and even the most horrible criminal is formed into a celebrity. Look at John Waters' Serial Mom. He kind of makes fun of that. We now have serial killer comic books, board games, trading cards. These things used to be reserved for superheroes. In a book about Richard Ramirez, the Satan-worshipping Night Stalker, the author described a young lady who was sitting through pre-trial hearings, and she'd sent love letters and pictures of herself to him. I feel such compassion for him. When I look at him, I see a real handsome guy who just messed up his life. 
Because he's never had anybody to guide him. She's reported to have said. Daniel Gringas, a psychopathic killer serving three lifetime sentences in Canada for murder and sexual assault, convinced the prison staff he should receive a day parole. He escaped custody and killed two people before he was recaptured. A woman from California read about this case, began writing to this man, and stated that she would like to marry him. I just saw this picture of him and I had this compassion. She said, It's very difficult for most of us to understand how some people can disregard the monstrous crimes committed by these killers that they so admire. What is clear, though, is many times they're victims of their own psychological hang-ups. These devoted admirers, some participate because of romantic need for unrequited love, others because of the notoriety, the titillation, or vicarious danger they experience and that still other people say that they see a cause worth fighting for, such as getting rid of that death penalty, a soul to be saved, or the firm belief that crimes were inevitable result of some kind of physical and or emotional abuse that occurred in its childhood. It couldn't help it. It is not only notorious males convicted of violent crimes who attract such followers, as the saga of Lawrence Bembenek illustrates. Nicknamed Bambi by the media, she's a former Playboy bunny, an ex-policeman, convicted of the murder of her husband's former wife in Milwaukee. She was sent to prison. Hundreds of people marked her birthday with party at the Grand Central Ballroom, following her escape from a prison rally held to celebrate the event through 300 people, waving signs that said things like, Run, Bambi, run! She fled to Canada, where she was soon recaptured. An extradition request by the United States resulted in an interminable series of hearings, delays, and fawning support from a vocal segment of the public that accepted and promoted her claim to be innocent. And she's just a victim of a frame-up by a male-dominated system. The Canadian authorities considered and rejected her submission that she was a political refugee on the run from American injustice. She was then returned back to the United States. Although she's attained some kind of a cult status and is the subject of a lot of magazine articles, TV programs, and many sympathetic books, one, of course, she had written, the Milwaukee authorities insisted that she was, in fact, an ice-cold killer. A cunning femme fatale. Guilty or innocent, media accounts represented her case as a telling example of using what you got and of society's mindless attraction to the glamorous and the beautiful. Recently, her original conviction was overturned and a new trial was ordered. She pleaded no contest to a lesser charge, was sentenced to time already served, and then released. She became a popular talk show guest. Bamba Neck's rise to fame was painfully slow compared to Amy Fisher's leap into the spotlight, who was called the Long Island Lolita. She was convicted of shooting her alleged boyfriend's wife in the head. It quickly became a media event and was the subject of three television movies, two presented on the same night. A disgruntled professional criminal who took part in one of their research projects, Dr. Harris, commented, She's a nobody. Then she tries to blow away her boyfriend's wife and botches the job. Now that's a big star. In most cases, the adulation given to these convicted of notorious crimes is harmless enough. The criminals very rarely helped, and the zealots are not put in real danger, at least as long as the focus of their ardor remains in prison. Rather than being victims of a psychopath's manipulative skills, they are willing participants in a macabre dance. I am the narcopath, and I was over here in TJ again. He was talking about one of my favorite subjects, buttons. I love to press people's buttons. If you want to know how I pressed yours, that's easy. One of the first things I noticed about you was that you were in pretty good shape. You were, in fact, trimmer than I was. <laughs> and you looked really good. But I had all through your cabinets. I saw you had all these diet products. I saw some stuff in your computer about how to lose weight, and I noticed that the dates were really recent. I knew this was something on your mind, but you hadn't mentioned it. So I just kept that little secret to myself. And then when we went to that party, and that guy, you know, the hot one, kept giving me the eye, and you swore he must know me, and I said, I don't know who that is. Everybody thinks they know me. Get over it. Turns out that you heard through so-and-so that that guy and I used to be an item. And of course, I didn't want you to know any of this. One of our co-workers knew him. I got the feeling that you were going to try to go to that girl and you were going to say something to her to find out the story is with him. And I made up a terrible story and said, I don't know who he is. He looks like someone I might have dated, but he's lying. He just wants you. I noticed how you were going to go to a social event that that chick was going to be at. And I couldn't have you talking to her. I made you a very nice dinner that I had catered with stolen money. I told you it was homemade. Get it? Homemade. That means it's narcopath made. 
when I got wind, because I checked your messages, I'd hooked up your phone to my computer so I could watch your every move. I could cheat and play around, but you couldn't. That's the way it works with the narcobath. When you told me you were going to the place where that event was, I knew that girl was going to be there that you might bump heads with and talk with and maybe get the scoop about me, which I couldn't have at that point. That's when I pressed your button. You'd never discussed your weight with me, but I knew your web searches, your product, all of it, which you thought you'd hidden behind that tampon box. Honey, I saw it all. When I got wind you were going there, I said, are you sure you want to go there? This is the way I do it. You said, well, yes, I want to go. Why wouldn't I? Just kind of acted a little strange. Which, of course, was designed to press your button there to get you to say, why? What are you talking about? I sounded really confident. When you asked, I had the answer. So I said, well, there's a girl that's going to be there. That one that you talked about that knows that guy that I don't know. If you need the truth, I wouldn't go to... Never, I shouldn't say anything. Which, of course, pressed your button even deeper. And you then were desperate to know... <laughs> What happened? You said. What did she say? When you walked by the other day, I didn't want to say anything because I think you're beautiful, but she was making an oinking sound like a pig. She was making fun of you. She was looking at you and doing this with her hands, and oh, I was going to tell her, I'll kick her and put her in her place, but teachers were coming down the hall, so I just left it. But if you want to go hang out with people like that, that's just fine, but it's not going to be good for yourself. She had no right to say that. That got you going. Your face went from a smile to... And you didn't go. You didn't go. And that was yet another success for me. And so you still don't know about it. Mm -hmm. Or as I'm concerned, you never will know. And if anyone tells you anything about it, that's easy. They're lying. They just want me. See how it works? I am going to live my dream. My people are going to arrange. That when Savani's people notify, they're going to tell her to some kind of emergency. And she won't be able to make it to her show. That's what I'm going to trot out in my seven-inch heels. I'm going to be on that stage, showing it all off. I'll take the stage away from her. They'll ask me to come back. They'll fire her. Or maybe they'll let her open for me. <laughs> I made an audition tape. Here it goes. <laughs> I'm the best. Throw it back to you. Bye now.